Welcome, willing workers, to our lesson for Sunday, August 20th. Is that right? Yeah, 20th, 2023. <laughs> our lesson today is entitled Just, J U S T, Just. We take it from Jeremiah chapter 50. <clears throat> I'm going to look at uh, two different sets of verses. 11 to 20 we'll look at, and then we'll look at the verses 33 and 34. Our lesson today has a theme, and that theme is this. Judgment awaits those who defy God. So here in uh, chapter 50 of Jeremiah, the uh, uh, verses that lead up to our verses for today are a <clears throat> oracle of woe that God has given Jeremiah to write and to say to the people of Babylon. So what we're going to be reading here is a continuation of that oracle of woe by Jeremiah to the people of Babylon. So we start at verse 11 <clears throat> and we read, Though you, Babylon, rejoice, Though you exalt, O plunderers of my heritage, though you frolic like a heifer in the pasture and neigh like stallions, your mother shall be utterly shamed, and she who bore you shall be disgraced. Behold, she shall be the last of the nations, a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. Because of the wrath of God, she shall not be inhabited, but shall be an utter desolation. Everyone who passes by Babylon shall be appalled and hiss because of all her wounds. Set yourselves in array against Babylon all around, all you who bend the bow. Shoot at her, spare no arrows. For she has sinned against God. Raise a shout against her all around. She has surrendered. Her bulwarks have fallen. Her walls are torn down. For this is the vengeance of the Lord God Almighty. Take vengeance on her. Do her as she has done. Cut off from Babylon the sower and the one who handles the sickle in time of harvest. Because of the sword of the oppressor, everyone shall turn to his own people. And everyone shall flee to his own land. Israel is a hunted sheep, driven away by lions. First the king of Assyria devoured Israel, and now at last Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has gnawed the bones. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing punishment on the king of Babylon and his land, as I punished the king of Assyria. I will restore Israel to his land as and he shall feed on Mount Carmel and in Bashan. And his desire shall be satisfied on the hills of Ephraim and in Gilead. In those days and in that time, declares the Lord, iniquity shall be sought in Israel and there shall be none. And sin in Judah and none shall be found. For I will pardon those whom I leave as a remnant. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the people of Israel are oppressed and the people of Judah with them. All who took them captive have held them fast. They refuse to let them go. Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will surely plead their cause that he may give rest to the earth, but unrest to the inhabitants of Babylon. 
History is full of accounts of notorious criminals who fled from justice, were fugitives for many years before they were caught. Many thought they could get away with it, the crimes that is, but the law eventually caught up with them. There are also accounts of fugitives who never were apprehended and appear to have escaped justice. D.B. Cooper, you might not know that name, but he's the first person who ever hijacked an airliner, forced it to land, forced the ransom to be brought on board, took off again, and had a parachute and jumped from the plane with his ransom money. He's never been found. Even though a criminal may escape judgment in this world, nobody defies God, nor is he able to escape the judgment of God. These chapters of Jeremiah 46 to 52, they contain oracles of woe against ten nations who surrounded Israel. God was sovereign over the world's nations back then, and he's sovereign over the nations of the world today. God judged his people for their sins by using the nations surrounding them as instruments of judgment against his people. Nebuchadnezzar was one of those. In our lesson last week, God warned the remnant who had not been hauled off to exile in Babylon not to go to Egypt. They disobeyed. Now Nebuchadnezzar is coming to Egypt and the people of Egypt needed to prepare for exile and shame themselves. Jeremiah also announced judgment on the Philistines as well as the people of Moab. Let's go to our verses and see what we can learn a little bit more. In verses 11 to 13, Jeremiah wrote, you, you rejoice and exult. These words depict the Babylonians' haughty attitude. They thought they were invincible. But the Lord further said they were nothing more than plunderers of my heritage. My heritage were the people of Israel. The Babylonians saw Judah as just another conquest. They didn't know God. They were just looking to expand their territory. And yet God used them as an instrument of judgment against the disobedient people, Israelites of Judah. And now God says he will avenge how the Babylonians treated his people. The statement frolic like a heifer, this highlights the arrogance of the people of Babylon, in particular King Nebuchadnezzar and all of his court. Now the law of Moses required that animals not be muzzled during the threshing process so that they could eat some of the grain that they were harvesting. The expression, nay, like the stallions, this symbolized Babylon's power and confidence in its own power. However, God was determined to destroy Babylon's arrogance and their own confidence. The expression, your mother designates Babylon and her children. This means Babylon's citizens. Hosea used the same imagery to describe Israel in Hosea chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. More than a century earlier, Isaiah highlighted Babylon's eventual downfall. We read about that in Isaiah 47. The phrase, last of the nations, this tells us of the reversal of Babylon's fortunes. A day was coming 
when Babylon would no longer exist. Wilderness and desert describes the fate of Babylon on its way to them. God would turn Babylon's luxurious land, that city Babylon, with its beautiful gardens in a desert, would no longer be beautiful. It would be a place of desolation. Babylon's demise would be a direct result of the wrath of God. God was judging them. It was a righteous judgment. And it was God's indignation, righteous indignation, against them for the way they had treated Jews. God is still God of all nations today. And he will judge all those who treat his people badly. Jeremiah noted that everyone who passed or will pass by Babylon's destruction, they will be appalled at how much, how badly the destruction was. They will actually hiss at the wounds of the empire of Babylon. Jeremiah had used these same words to warn the people of Judah what would happen to Jerusalem. Travelers coming through Jerusalem and now through De uh, Babylon would see the de devastation. They would have no empathy and certainly no pity for either country or people. The Hebrew word for appalled implies utter destruction, just as Nebuchadnezzar did in 586, when he burned the city of Jerusalem. He broke down the fortified walls of the city. He plundered and burned the temple. Hissing by the people who see this destruction in significant signifies their derision at what had happened. Verses 14 and 15. Armies here uh, would surround a city. They would prevent escape of any of its citizens. And they would also cut off any supplies of food and water that go into the city. They would starve them before they would kill them. Jeremiah urged those invading Babylon not to spare any arrows. Don't have any pity on these people. Babylon would receive the invaders full force as God determined it would be. Babylon's sins against God were the reason for her punishment. The Babylonians were God's instruments of justice against his people Judah. But these people in Babylon had shown no mercy to the captives they had taken to Babylon because they, the Babylonians, were full of pride and, adult and idolatry. God instructed the invaders of Babylon to raise a shout against the Babylonians. The peoples raising their voices against Jericho bring is brought to mind in this, which we read of in Joshua 6. Jeremiah used vivid terms to illustrate Babylon's defeat. The first one he used, the city had surrendered, just as those in Jerusalem tried to surrender. Babylonians did surrender, but the Babylonians did not know if they would receive mercy from the invading army. Otherwise, though, they had no hope. Whether they fought or whether they surrendered, they were going to be defeated, and they had no hope. The second thing was Babylon, Babylon's bulwarks. These are like uh, century towers 
around the fortifications around the city. Soldiers would be there, lookouts would be there to watch for invading armies. These bulwarks stood higher than the city walls, but these would also be collapsed, torn down. The city's walls, which provided protection for its citizens inside, would also be destroyed, just as Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem's walls. God's judgment against his people uh, occurred in Jerusalem. Now God's judgment against the Babylonians was coming. Jeremiah did encourage the Babylon invaders to take vengeance on Babylon for God. And this would be in getting even, if you will, and correcting the injustices that Babylon had shown to the people of Judah. The prophet also urged to do Babylon as she had done to Israel. Babylon now would experience the pain that she had inflicted on others. The sword of the oppressor would bring disaster. It would make people fear for their lives, just as the Israelites feared for their lives and ran to hide who were not in the city of Jerusalem. Those who would escape or could escape Babylon would do so. As believers today, we can face a future knowing God will exact justice, especially on those who are vengeful and wrong, his chosen ones. But we have to remember that God will bring justice in God's timing. It is not for us to take any vengeance. Israel was described as being a hunted sheep, chased by lions. Lions were powerful enemies back in those days. They don't inhabit that territory now, but back then they did. And the sheep were prey, food for the lions. And the Babylonians now would face powerful enemies and they had little choice against these enemies coming at them. Jeremiah named Assyria as the first whom God devoured because they are the ones who attacked and hauled off some people from the northern kingdom into Assyria and they brought in their own Assyrians to settle in that land and intermarry. The Babylonians were the ones who came to the southern kingdom, Judah, led by first Nebo Blaster or Nebo Blaster, the father of Nebuchadnezzar II. Judah witnessed what had happened to Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, but unfortunately they did not heed the words and warnings of God. The twin conquests by the Assyrians and now the Babylonians are two of the darkest times of the history in Old Testament. Let's go to verses 18 to 20. The Lord of hosts here refers to and stresses the sovereignty of God over his creation. <clears throat> Jeremiah's words reminded the people that God's words actually came from Jeremiah, but they were God's words, not Jeremiah's. In 612 BC, the Assyrian capital fell. That capital was Nineveh. Y'all remember that from scripture. And the Babylonian empire added to its territory when it defeated Nineveh, Nabo-Blazer came to Jerusalem in 626 for the first foray. His son came, Nebuchadnezzar II, came two more times 
to plunder Jerusalem and carry off more exiles. However, the Babylonian Empire would only last the 70 years that Jeremiah wrote in his book. 539 BC, the Persians invaded Babylon and conquered it. God also guaranteed that he would restore Israel back to his pasture that he had given them. He said there would be plentiful rainfall made at Mount Carmel, and that would be the best place to grow crops. Bashan, a territory of plains east of the Jordan River, had good soil and pasture land and provided abundant grain. The best cattle came from Bashan, as well as the horses of uh, the king's court of Israel. The hills of Ephraim were Israel's richest agricultural territory, and the city of Gilead was also rich in its soil. The words declares that the Lord says, thus says the Lord. That's a common expression throughout the Old Testament books when the prophets are writing, thus says the Lord, and that, as I've said many times, emphasizes that what they are speaking and writing are not their own opinion, but the words of the living God. Jeremiah announced that when God restores his people, God would not only rescue them, but he would cleanse them spiritually. That means their sins were forgiven. And if anyone came looking for sin and iniquity and evil in the restored land, the search would not yield a single one. The reference to both Israel and Judah anticipate a day when God would once again restore his people as one nation in the land. The term remnant designates those left after God's judgment came down on the northern and southern kingdoms. Let's finish our lesson. The Lord of hosts, that phrase once again stresses the power and sovereignty that God has over his creation. He's the one who reigns over the entire universe and all of the angelic host which he created himself. God's people, humans, <coughs> were oppressed. They were treated unjustly. And God promised to judge Assyria and Babylon respectively for their cruelty both had held God's people fast. They wouldn't let them go. The word redeemer here denotes someone who rescues or ransoms a particular situation. Naomi was ransomed through the marriage of Ruth to Boaz. Jeremiah redeemed his own relative's land right there in the southern kingdom, the ultimate redeemer, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. He brought redemption for us. And on that cross, he paid what we owed for our sin, for he was hung on a cross, though he sinned not. Jeremiah assured that God would plead the cause of his people. God would give rest to the earth. Now we don't know that rest yet. God has yet to come to send his son in power and in judgment to give this earth rest. As believers, we can be confident that God is capable of redeeming us, his people. 
He has promised never to leave or abandon us. Hebrews 13, 5. And God will work His purpose in and through His children. That's us, dear Christians. Are you a child of the living God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for showing us that you take vengeance for your people and that your word has promised you will take vengeance again this time in judgment against the entire earth. That your people will be saved. That all those on earth who do not know you will be judged according to their works and then consigned to the fires of hell. Oh, Father, may it never be, but your will be done in all things. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.